Okay. All right, so we got that. Oh, you got to watch that. They, they, they make, isn't that like part of, like, a huge part of the plot? The Fibonacci number? It was, well, not a huge part, but it was the password of some kind of combination lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that was, uh, I think, the earlier part of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was that. It was a good movie with Tom Hanks. Yep. All right, so, okay, first thing first, I'm going to reopen the recursive call lab so that you guys can turn it in. <coughs> so right now it is 36. Do you guys think uh, five minutes would be enough to turn it in? Oh, you're still waiting for your computer to turn on? Okay, I'll give you guys half an hour. Yeah. So let me go edit. So half an hour. What about 6.15? Okay. But I will still be working on today's new lab, you know, as we wait for you guys, you know, as you guys upload it, okay? All right, so let's change the time. Did it matter what we have N set to? N set what? Um, like the function parameter, what we're feeding into it in main. Yeah. No, that one does not matter. Okay. The question mark, question mark, question mark can be anything when you're testing it, so that's fine. Um, nope, you can just give it a particular number, that's fine. Not a, no need to spend your time to fix that. <coughs> okay, so... If you check, if you refresh the page now, you should be able to turn it in. So for those of you who have not turned it in yet, you have until 6.15 to turn it in. <coughs> and then what I'm going to do now is to start with a new lab, okay? Okay, because the new lab takes a little bit of explanation um, I don't want to do it during the le uh, during the lecture because you know that's just uh, th we'll be doing something related during the lecture. But since you guys have the lab before the lecture, so I can't really do it. You know, wait until the lecture. So that's the uh, that's the thing about um, this kind of time arrangement. Okay. Um, you should have access to this one as well. It's, it should be open already. It is about structures. So question number one is really kind of easy. You know, um, all it does is asking you um, if we have a byte-wide architecture and we want to pack members of a structure as pack as tightly as how many bytes is it is this particular structure going to take up? Yes. Oh, struct. S T R U C T. Struct. The one that is due in at uh, six fifteen is fib. F I B. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Huh? 24? <laughs> it's asking number of bytes. Maybe. I'm not going to tell you. Okay, so the, the second question is pushing one step further, okay, just to help you understand how structures are implemented in assembly code. So in the second question, it is giving you a sample code, which is just main all by itself. I give you the assembly language you know, implementation of main. And then the question is asking, okay, so let me scroll down here. The question is asking which line in assembly code, and, and the slash slash, you know, the, the number to the right hand side of the slash slash is the line number. So it's asking you which line, imp, uh, which line updates var1.ptr. In the original C code, var1.ptr equals to ampersand var1 is over here. So the question is, which line of the assembly code is doing the update 
of PTR as a member of the variable var1. So with this one, there's really no choice. You have to uh, read the code and understand what each line is doing, keep track of the registers, and then try to figure out which line is do, do, doing that job. So, but you do have you know, a week to work on this one, this, partic this entire lab. So I'm not gonna give you the answer here, okay? Um, <clears throat> Question number three. So question number three is giving you a different structure definition. Um, if, you are if you have taken um, data structure, you might recognize this. Do you guys recognize this at all? For those of you who have taken uh, data structure, it's a binary search tree kind of node, right? Okay, so the node itself has a value, which in this case is just an unsigned A-bit integer. And then we have a pointer to a left node, and therefore this is L, lowercase l. And then we have a pointer to the right node, that's why this is a lowercase r. Is that okay? Now, if you have not taken data structure, this should not bother you either. Because you know, even in CISP 360, we talk about members and how each member can be, a, you know, can be anything, basically. It can be a pointer to a structure, just like what we have here. Are there any questions about the structure definition itself? Node is the name of the structure, which is basically a cookie cutter. Value is the name of the first member. L is the name of the second member, and then R is the name of the third member. Okay? Value is not, nothing mysterious. It is just an unsigned A-B number. So it can contain the value from zero all the way up to 255, okay? L is slightly interesting. It is a pointer to a struct node, which means if you follow that pointer, it will point you to the beginning of another struct node. Can it be the same structure as the one that is containing this particular member? Yeah, it can be, okay? But most likely than not, it is pointing to another structure at the very beginning. Is that okay? All right. So what is following here is, oh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, gotcha. Um, so what is following here is actual TTP ASM, Tax Toy Processor Assembly you know, source code. And you can see it's a, just a bunch of label definitions and a whole bunch of bytes, okay? So the question is asking how many node structures or struct nodes you know, are being defined using this assembly code? The answer is just glaring at you in the face. Um, you know, I'm hoping you guys do not need to spend too much time on this one about the answer to the question, okay? But what is interesting is I'm defining a binary search tree using, using assembly and I'm statically defining a tree at this point. So, the, the most important part about this question is not so much about the question, okay? I, I wanna put a question here just so that you guys have to do something so it's slightly interactive. But the important part about this question is, in the first structure, what is the value? The value is five, and where does it point to with L? It points to the node starting at label N2. And what about R? It points to a node that is starting at label N3. What is at label N2? Another struct. What is the value of that struct starting at label N2? Three. What is the left pointer? It points to which means, you know, we stop here, okay? It doesn't have a left child to speak of. What is, where is it right child? Does it have a right child? And where is the left ch uh, right child? At label N4, okay? So when, they, when you follow all of this stuff here, you, for those of you who have taken um, CISP 430, you can actually draw a binary search tree, you know, once you understand what this is doing. Is that okay? What if you have not taken data structure? <laughs> understand it. 
it would still be the same thing. You know, it's basically you know treating the second member and the third member of each structure as a pointer. So you can still draw pointers. Um, every time you see a label, basically, whenever you see a label reference, you draw an arrow. So you can draw an arrow here from N2 here to the label definition, which is here. N3, draw an arrow from here to here. And then N4, draw an arrow from here to here. And then N5 is all by itself, but it, it does go from here to here. When you see zero as the second or the third field or member, that means they're, they're not pointers anymore. Zero means it is a null pointer. And I'm pretty sure the concept of a null pointer is discussed in CISP 360. Or am I mistaken? It was discussed. OK, so basically a null pointer indicates, don't follow me. This is the end. Is that OK? So I'll be OK so far with question number three. OK, Here's come, here comes the last question, which is the most important one. I'm, I give it one point, OK? But that's fine, OK? We'll keep it at one point. <laughs> this, is where, <laughs> this is where you have to write the code. This is where all the work is supposed to be at, and I did not give you enough point values. <coughs> But it's a homework assignment. It is not so much the point value that is important. It is what you're going to learn from writing the code that is important, OK? <laughs> OK. This is by no means any hint of whether to do the homework assignment or not. <laughs> Trust me, it is important to do this homework assignment because you know, the, in the test, in the final exam, you may see something similar to this. Mm -hmm. So if you know how to do this already, it might make the final exam easier. <coughs> the final exam is 40% of your final grade. So <laughs> don't lose tens of points because of one. Is that OK? And this point is one of four of this homework assignment, which is out of 20% of all the points that we add up for all the homework assignments. So even though this question by itself may only affect a small fraction of a single percent of your final grade, by doing it, it might have an impact on many points in the, home, in the final exam, OK? OK, so let's look at this program here, this, you know, this subroutine here, and try to find out what it's doing. First of all, we look at the parameters, OK? So focus on the parameters first. The parameters involve two. There are two parameters. The first one is PTR. Let me just kind of zoom in here a little bit. Doesn't, doesn't may, it may not work well to zoom in, but I'll tr okay, this is as much as I can do. Because, uh, OK, there we go. So PTR is a pointer. It's a pointer pointing to a structure. And we're using the same node definition as the previous question. OK, guys, I'm still. Trying to work this out here. OK, the second parameter is called array, and this is a double pointer. OK, you can call array a pointer to a pointer. You can call it a pointer to an array, and so you can call it an array <laughs> of pointers, but it doesn't really change what it is. OK, it is basically a pointer to a pointer to an unsigned A bit integer. Is that OK? It means if you follow the parameter, it will get you to a pointer, to an unsigned A-bit integer. If you follow it one more time, then it will be an actual A-bit unsigned integer. Is that OK? All right. The code is saying, the first thing you ask is, is PTR a 0 or not? If PTR is a 0, there's no else corresponding to this if. You're done. No, there's, not, there's nothing you need to do. Is that OK? This is how we stop the recursion. On the other hand, if PTR is not null, which means it is pointing to a particular structure, then you have two additional questions to ask. The first additional question to ask is, does, is the left pointer of the node pointed by PTR, is that pointer null? If it is not you know, null, then you traverse it. Now, it is actually not needed, but I just you know, put the condition here. 
because you know it this one will catch a null tree anyway but if pt if the l portion of the if the l member of the structure pointed to by ptr is not null then you recursively call the subroutine and traverse it array is passed the way it is okay there's no incrementing there's no add one you just pass array the way it is but the first parameter is not just ptr it is going to be the l member of PTR. Is that okay? When the recursion returns, then you perform this. I would say out of this entire homework assignment, this line may be the most challenging. Okay? Because it has got two D reference on the left hand side and a plus plus and the auto increment. So exactly what are we doing here? Well, let's find out. When you look at something like this, particularly something like this, okay, and let me, I'm just going to magnify this a little bit because it makes it easier to <coughs> talk about. So, notepad. And I'll just copy and paste this entire code here. So, my question is okay, first of all, do we know how to get to this? the member value of the node pointed to by PTR. Can we get to that? If you can do the swap, sub, uh, the swap subroutine, this one is just as easy, okay? Because it has to do with the positioning of value as a member in the structure, <laughs> okay? So I'm not expecting a whole lot of problem on the right-hand side. It is the left-hand side that looks kind of nasty, and it looks like, can we actually do this? Have we learned enough concepts in CISP 360 to do this? Because that is the prerequisite of this class, and I'm making the assumption of that. Is that okay? Okay, so when you look at something that is confusing, that seems to be confusing, and seems to involve a lot of complicated operation, where do you start? Panic attack? You start with what you can actually start with, right? So in, if, when you have nested parentheses, where do you start? All the way in, as inside as possible, okay. So you start with array. So can we get to array? Where is array? Array is a parameter. Do we know how to get to the second parameter of a subroutine? Swap has two parameters. So we know how to get to the second parameter of a subroutine, okay? In a sense, this subroutine is easier than swap because it doesn't have a local variable. There's no T, okay? Okay, once you get to array, what are you gonna do? You dereference it, right? In other words, the next thing you do is you handle this dereference operator. Is that okay? So that would give you what? If you combine all of this, what is the type of this expression? Is it pointed to a UN8 underscore T or a bit integer? Okay, so that's absolutely correct. <clears throat> okay, now what am I doing with it? Increment, but it is a post increment. Okay, so if it's, a, it's a, if it's a post increment, you have to be very careful because in most cases, in many of your CISP 360 homework assignments, um, if the auto increment is on its own on a, in a, as a statement, it doesn't matter whether it is pre-incrementing or post-incrementing because in those cases, you're, using, you're only using the side effect of the increment, but you're not actually using the value of the increment. Is that okay? But in this case, something is using the value of the auto increment. This asterisk operator on the outside is actually using the value of the auto increment. So now, pre-increment versus post-increment makes a difference. In other words, if I were to change, I'm gonna change it back, so don't write it down. So if I, if, if I were to change this expression to something like this, it would not behave the same way as the original code, which has the plus plus after the expression. Yep. So the first thing I'm thinking about that is the increment has to happen after the evaluation of the value. 
Yes. So the plus plus technically happens after you store the value. After you utilize the value for the referencing, then you auto increment. It is as if, as if it is on its own line. Okay. So let me say that one more time. It is as if the auto increment is on its own line after this entire statement. Yep, you can do it like this. But you have to remember the plus plus does not apply to array. It applies to what array points to. Okay? So it is equivalent to this code without the auto post increment here. But you perform the first statement the way it is without the post increment. Then you have another statement just to add one to not array, but what array points to. Is that okay? Okay, so now that we have taken the post increment mystery out of that line, <clears throat> then you can look at the first line here and go like, oh, okay, so the parentheses are not actually needed anymore because, you know, or at least we can remove one without causing it to be difficult to read. This is basically a D, double D reference. So where am I actually storing the right hand side? I'm not storing to the parameter. I'm not overwriting the parameter. I'm not overwriting what the parameter is pointing to. I'm overwriting the location that is pointed to by the location that is pointed to by array as a parameter. Is that okay? And then after this, we have you know, a very symmetric code to the earlier one, which is you know, we checked member R of the structure pointed to by PTR to see if it is no. If it is no, we don't have to do a single thing. If it is not no, then we also execute the traverse code. Okay, so I mistakenly you know, wrote this code to be a little bit longer than it needs to be. For those of you who want to make this as simple as possible, because your time is precious, you can basically remove um, the conditional statements without causing any harm. Okay, so I'm going to get back to, I'll explain why that is the case, but I'm just going to show you what the code would look like after I remove the extra code that is actually not needed. It doesn't hurt either, it's just not needed. Okay. So this is the code that would do exactly the same thing as the original one. Why do you think the conditional statement is really not needed? What? Hmm? Exactly. So it's only a matter of are you going to have one extra recursion level or not? Because with this code, even though it seems like it is not in, it seems like we are going to do the recursion regardless. But if PTR points to L, if the L member is a null, we are still doing the recursion. But as soon as we get to the next level, PTR is going to be null, and we go like, oh, there's nothing to do, return immediately. Is that okay? So if you want to simplify the impl implementation, take out the two inner conditional statements because they are not needed. It's not incorrect. It is just that you know, they save you one level of recursion. So in the grand scheme of things, they're not saving you a lot of time. The code is not too complicated either, but it is to, I mean, it's up to you. If you want to not implement the inner conditional statement, leave them out. And if you want to look at the post increment exactly like this, do it this way too. Because that's exactly what a post increment is supposed to do. It's one more level of recursion, that's all. Yep. So it doesn't save you all that much time. So the order of magnitude would not change. All right. How do you test this code? And using the data structure that is defined in the previous question, what are we going to get? So here's the code to test it. Okay. I'll give you this code in assembly as well. But first of all, I'm going to give you the code in, um, in C first. And we'll just mention here that N1 is defined 
earlier. Okay, so we are assuming that M1 is already defined. So the code is going to be something like this, u in 8 underscore t. Uh, we'll make this an array, and we'll say sorted. In this case, we only get, okay, I'm, I, I was about to ask a question to add and answer it, but whatever number of nodes you think there are in this program, this array needs to be of that size. Is that okay? So the number of nodes, you know, should be the size of this array called, called sorted. I'm just going to put in a number that is incorrect here. Okay, I'm putting 50, which is not the correct number. Okay, but it's related to the number that we're supposed to be using. Okay. <laughs> okay, so to test your subroutine, okay, you just have to call traverse. Okay, traverse. <clears throat> And then the first node is going to be just N1. Okay, now this part is kind of confusing because N1 is a label in assembly code which is designating a particular address of a byte. But in C code, the technical correct syntax is percent, I mean, M percent and N1 because M1 in C code would be representing an actual structure. So that's why they're slightly different. And I'll show you the code you know, that you can do in the equivalent code in C um, in this particular code, uh, program. Um, so we get M1, and then we have the, uh, ooh, this is going to be a little bit interesting because we need one more local variable here. So we need a local variable called uin8 underscore t, and we'll just call this, I don't know, it's some kind of a pointer, but I don't want to use PTR. Um, P sorted, okay, you know, pointer to the sorted array. All right, so this is the C code that you should write in order to test the program. This is the subroutine that you need to implement. I will give you the main, okay? I will give you the main you know, code, um, not as a part of the question, because once you start the quiz, I can make additional changes, it won't reflect. So I'm gonna include that in the main module, so you can just download it. Is that okay? <clears throat> oh, right, I need to uh, give you the equivalent definitions of N1 and so on. So let me give you that too. All right, so N1 is actually looking like this. N1 by itself is a struct node. But then you can also use um, curly brace to define the members inside a structure. It is a initialized global structure in this sense. So I need to remember it's a five in that question. Yep, here we go. So we have a five. And then we have the address of N1, N2, and then the address of N3, like that. And then we have struct node N2 equals to, um, I'm just switching back to look at the number, three. So we got three. You can use a zero, there's no need to cast a zero into a pointer to use it. And then the address of N4, Curly, curly brace, but to do it this way, you will have to do an extern struct node and two first. If you don't do this line, um, then when you refer to the address of n two, the compiler will complain about it. Is that okay? So I'm just giving you the equivalent C code of what I did earlier in the previous question. Do we have any questions about the C code here on line 13, 14, and 15? Can you guys relate these lines of code back to question number three, where we define N1, N2, N3, but using the byte construct in assembly? Is that part okay? All right, cool, okay. Yep, 
I'm just I, I'm not giving you the entire thing because that will make counting the number of nodes, you know, like I don't want to spell out that answer, even though the answer is really simple to begin with. <laughs> okay, there's one more thing here. P sorted needs to be initialized with sorted. In other words, P sorted is a pointer that is initialized to the beginning of the sorted array where you will store all the values. Okay, so this is the entire program in C, you know, save for the struct definition, which is already a part of the question. So are there any questions about the C version of this code? And remember, you don't need to write main, you don't need to define the structures, you just need to write traverse. Is that okay? So I'm gonna give you the C code for main. So let me switch back and start a new window. All right. The node stuff you can go, you can, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll make it e very easy on you guys. Because you know, I don't want to make the tedious part time consuming so that you don't have any excuse about you know not having enough time to work on the difficult part. <laughs> okay, so here's the structure stuff, and your main is going to go before this. Oops. <coughs> there we go. Okay. All right. So that's the beginning. You know, we initialize the stack pointer. We have the main as the critical entry point, which is totally not needed, right? Um, I am going to allocate, I'm gonna use the same order here. Basically, the, um, the first local variable will have a lower address, and then the later local variable will, later variable will have a higher address. So when I draw this, okay, as a map, I'm going to say p sorted is the variable that has a higher address, and then sorted is going to be the one that has a lower address. Um, none of these two local variables are initialized, so that means you know, the first thing I need to do is really just to allocate enough bytes to do this. Okay. This is the part where you have to make some adjustments because if you do it this way, you may run out of stack space. Okay, so you will need to make some adjustments. I will indicate where you need to make some adjustments. LDI a with 51, okay. This is allocating too much for sorted. So you're gonna have to change this 51 to something else, <laughs> okay. It's 51 is overkill, I'm, that's what I'm telling you, okay. Change it to something else, yep. It's fib, F-I-B, yep. Mm -hmm. And then we do a subtraction, D-A, in order to allocate for all the local variables. In other words, I'm using only one single subtraction to allocate for every single local variable in main. Yes? Um, because there are 50 bytes in sorted, plus one byte, which is p-sorted. Because oh, gotcha. we got two local variables, I'm using only one single subtraction to allocate for both, okay? But the 51 is total overkill, so fix that. Change it to something that is appropriate. Okay, so after we allocate, then the next thing we do is we want to copy sorted to p-sorted. Now, this line of code is what makes C very difficult to deal with. It is the, the confusion between a pointer versus an array, okay? Sorted is an array. P-sorted is a pointer. They are not the same. In this context, they are not the same. Because sorted is actually an array of 50 bytes. We know the allocation already. So when we refer to sorted, we are not referring to the 50 bytes in the array, we are referring to the address of the entire array, okay? When we are referring to p-sorted, which is a pointer, 
it stores an, an address of an unsigned AB integer. So the way to do this in assembly, in this case, is actually not too bad. Um, at this point, if this is the map, okay, if sorted is at a lower address and P sorted is at a higher address, do we have a pointer pointing to sorted at this point? Yep, okay. So we just need to find out you know, where P sorted is located. Now remember, sorted has 50 bytes. So to do that calculation, we make a copy of the stack pointer. And then we do some calculations to C. So now C is pointing to P sorted. Is that okay? So once we have one register being the right-hand side, and the other register, C in this case, being the address of the left-hand side, we can now do the store instruction here, store C, D. In other words, I'm telling you that D is pointing to sorted, because it is the lower portion, it's the first local variable. C, by after the computation, is now pointing to B, P sorted, so we have to store D to whatever C points to. So this basically completes uh, p sorted pointer to sorted equals to sorted. That implements that line. Any questions about the assembly implementation? Yep. Yes. No, because, because remember, the first element of an array is always having a lower address than the second element of an array. Is that part okay? All right. Cool. Um, so now we are ready to implement line 21 of traverse. Um, we have to pass two parameters. The first parameter is the address of P sorted. Well, that's kind of handy, isn't it? Because something is pointing to it already. All right, so we, we do a decrement D to allocate the space for the argument. And then we say, we're going to push C on the stack because C is the address of P sorted already. OK, hold on. Let's, let's check here. Okay, does everything check out? Is, are the types matching at this point? In other words, if I claim that C is the address of P sorted and it is being pushed on the stack, does it match the type of the second parameter of traverse? Okay, tell me what is the type of P sorted in the C code? It's a pointer to a unsigned A bit integer. Very good. What is the address of P sorted then? It's a pointer to a pointer to an unsigned AB integer. Does that match the type of the second parameter of traverse? So it passes that test. Okay, very good. Okay, now we are ready to push the first parameter, which is N1, the address of N1 in C code. If that is, um, and we have N1 defined here, okay? So now the question is, how do we push the address of N1, the node structure, on the stack? Uh-huh. Low i a n1, and then decrement d to decrease the stack to allocate for that parameter, and then do st d a. And then we have one more thing. You know, this this part is really boring, return main, return from traverse, and then we decrement D, store that to the stack, push it on the stack, and now we can have unconditional branch to traverse, like that, main, return from traverse, is a label here. When it's all done, we are done with line 21. 
after line 21, we got nothing else to do except for return zero. So that means you know, we have to first increment D twice to deallocate the two arguments from the stack. And then since there's nothing else to do, we're going to deallocate the local variables. So that's going to be LDIA with 51 because we have 51 bytes of local variables. And then we add that to register D to allocate all the local variables. And then we got nothing else to do except to halt. So somebody's going to say, can we combine line 22, line 23, and line 24 to, so that we just load A with 53? The answer is yes, absolutely, because incrementing D twice and then adding 51 to it is eventually adding 53 to D. They, they are exactly the same. But I'm doing it this way in order to separate based on the function of these code. These two lines of code, line 22 and line 23, is to deallocate arguments pushed on the stack because of the function call. Line 25 and line 26 is to deallocate the local variables. So conceptually, they represent different operations related to the operation of a function, and that's why I'm separating those. Is that okay? Are there any questions about the main at this point? Question? Yep. Um, why not just LDI D0? Um, because if you do LDI D0, that will only work if you're in main. This code, except for the halt, will work in any subroutine. Uh huh. Um, we know that we won't need those variables anymore, right? But what if you want to turn your main into a, a subroutine that is not main, so they can be called by another subroutine? Because sometimes that happens. You you start okay. It depends on your programming style. I am kind of more or less a bottom up kind of developer, so I write the most the lowest level type of functions first, and then I use my main to test those things, and then I turn some of my main into its own subroutine, or at least a part of another subroutine. So I constantly turn my main to something else and then write another main to be the actual main. So that's why I typically write code like this, so that if I do need to m turn this main into a subroutine, I just need to change the halt into the three opcode for returning, and then main becomes just like any other normal subroutine. You mean LDI D0? Yeah. Right, because it's, it's a shortcut that works, but only in the context of you're in main. This will work in any subroutine. And from the concept of a class, you know, I just want to reinforce you know, how the stack is right. utilized. <laughs> yep. So I understand where you're coming from, okay? because eventually it is the same thing. But from the perspective of com illustrating the concepts, you know, I would like to spell it out and so that people can understand how the stack pointer is moved up and down. Yeah. Yep. Now, if this is done and, this, and D ends up with a zero, I feel good about it because I know that I have used the stack correctly. I have you know, allocated and deallocated everything correctly. If I, if I substitute these instructions with a LDI D zero and D becomes zero at the end of the program, then I don't know exactly whether I did utilize the stack correctly or not. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So I would like to check all of those things you know, when I write my code. OK. All right, so with this all done, um, I'm going to put a, a stub subroutine here. So I'm going to put my little stub subroutine of traverse all the way here. And I'm just going to put a halt instruction here. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, I'm only going to give you the code as a template with main with the definition of the structures. And then I'm going to stop here. I just need to make sure that the parameters on the stack are pushed correctly. So I will give you a starting point like this, and then you kind of have to run with it. Is that OK? All right. So Control A, copy this. And do we have the assembler? Yes, we do. Not surprisingly.
Oh, trying to connect. Uh oh. It's probably. Okay, let me. The cool part about this homework assignment is after this one, you can now tell all your friends that you implemented at least one subroutine in binary search tree in assembly. Huh? But depending on who's reading it, it can have a lot of significance. <laughs> Oh, I'm not signed in. It doesn't, it's not convinced that I've signed in. Do, okay. Sign back in. And I thought, you know, they use a single sign in thing for Canvas and apps. That does not appear to be true. There we go. Okay. So now that should be happier now. Okay, delete. Paste. Oops. That is not. Okay. All looks good. Control K, run the code. Now it has stopped. And I will double check what is in RAM. All right. So this is what we have in RAM here. And does it look right to you? OK. Well, OK. So where's my stack pointer? Because we are at the entry point of the first call to traverse, okay? It is important for me to designate it's the first call to traverse because traverse <coughs> is recursive. So when you are running your code, you will see multiple invocations of that. So D is CA, okay? Does it make sense that D is CA? That is the question, first question you have to ask. We got 51 bytes used by local variables in main, right? And then we got two more bytes used by parameters or arguments that we use to call traverse, and then plus the return address. So we have 51 plus 3, which is 54 bytes. Is that okay? So we, we, we should be looking at 256 minus 54. And what is that? 256 minus 254 is 202. Okay? Is 202 CA? That becomes the next question. Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Okay, maybe use a bigger window. There we go. I'm going to cheat here and use my command line uh, calculator. 
See, there's a command line equivalent to everything. So we got 12, which is the C times 16, because it is the most significant digit, plus uh, A, which is a 10, and that turns out to be 202. So everything works out so far as far as the stack pointer is concerned. You know, we got the right kind of stuff on the stack, or right number on the stack. Then the next question is, do we have the right values on the stack? In other words, we look at location C, A, and up, and go, we ask, is that the right kind of stuff? This is C0, C4, C8, C9, this is C, A, okay? So looks looks right, okay? C, A has a non-zero value. This is supposed to be the return address. In, in, in other words, 1, 5 as a, hex, as a hexadecimal number should be main return from traverse, okay? You can look it up, and I'm pretty sure that is correct. Then the next question is, we got um, 1B and FF here as my parameters. 1B is which one again? It's our first or second parameter. My first parameter, which is N1, okay? So you look up N1 and you ask, is that N1 over here? You can check the assembler for that purpose as well. So this is one, uh, one eight, yep, this is one eight, this is uh, nine, A, B, this is B. Is the first node starting with a five? Yep, okay, so we are pretty sure this one B is in fact the address of node one, N one, okay? What about FF? Is that my local variable called P sorted? And P sorted is supposed to be initialized to the beginning of the entire array, which is sorted, right? Where is the beginning of sorted in terms of the addresses? It is, well, next to the FF is the last byte. No, I, I meant, excuse me, I meant the FF sorting RAM. You mean, you mean this byte here? That is correct. So now the question is, is that CD? Because we have CD stored in P sorted, which is supposed to be the address of sorted, which is a local variable in main. That is the question. So is that zero, zero here, that is to the right-hand side of this FF, is that location CD? Well, let's check. C0, C4, C8, CC, CD. So everything checks out. So this program, as it is right now, can be used as a starting point for the longer part of your homework assignment. Is that okay? Yep. Is this last one kind of focused to the final exam that we did on the other one? This is a one-week uh, lab, so this will take us to next Thursday, and then on next Thursday we will go over the practice final. Yep, so this is the last lab that we are going to do. What is the last day of class before final? Next Tuesday? Next Tuesday? Okay, so that matches up pretty perfectly. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Hmm? Next Thursday. Not the next Thursday, the Thursday after that is our final. Two weeks from today. <laughs> Okay, so in case of doubt, what do we do? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, in case of doubt, we vote. <laughs> See who's the majority. The majority, whatever the majority says is truth. Hmm? Final is a freebie. Who seconds? <laughs> Those who agree say aye, right? <laughs> Okay. It's okay. I'm I'm going to double check. I, I, I think you know after taking CISP three sixty we can figure this out from the descriptions. <clears throat> All right, so this is <laughs> this is a Tuesday, Thursday class. The instruction starts at seven o'clock, right? So seven PM Tuesday, Thursday class, 
So our final exam is May 15th, which is a Tuesday, from 8 to 10 p.m. The good news is Hovet is still open after the final is done, so we can all go to the Vietnamese restaurant. <laughs> I didn't say I pay for it. <laughs> yep. Yes. Which is going to be very natural because you know the final exam is heavily leaned in on the material after the second exam. Huh? Now, easy is all subjective. <laughs> I stop answering that question, you know, uh, uh, you know, when people ask me, so is it going to be easy? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> hmm? That's going to be di difficult to make small questions, you know, because you know all of these things, you know, is it's the concept of how you combine the instructions. It is not even at this point. It's not so much what each instruction is doing that is important. It is how groups or sequences of instructions are doing that is important. So that makes it very difficult to ask <laughs> short and simple questions. <laughs> okay, so. Let me, let, me, let me upload the program that I just wrote so that you guys don't have to frantically copy and type it on your own. You did? Well, it's already in the spreadsheet, by the way. So if you want to just copy and paste it, you can actually use the spreadsheet for that purpose. In other words, in other words, you go to the spreadsheet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's over there because I just assembled the whole thing. And it is the one that I used in the simulation, so it has to be the correct one, right? Did you record this? Yep. It is being re it's being streamed, so it's all good. All right, so I'm going to save this into the temp folder as struct.ttpasm. Go back to Canvas. All right, so I just added the uh, source code that I wrote earlier today and uploaded it as struct.ttpasm. You guys can use that as a starting point. And I can also tell you what the answer is supposed to be, like you know, what should be in the, in the array itself. What do you guys think? Especially those of you who have taken CISP 430. The question is, what is the array going to contain when the program is done? Okay, so let's let's check out the the, the, the tree first. Okay, so we'll go to question number three. Okay, so we have this is the root because this is what we are passing to the traverse subroutine, right? Its left node is n two. And N2 does not have a left node, it only has a right node of 4, N4, which has a value of 4. So this is the root, this is the left of the root, and this one is the right of the left to the root. N3 is the right of the root, it goes here, has a value of 10, and it has a left node, which has a value of 9, has no right node. And we are doing a in-order traversal of a binary search tree, which means it's going to print these values in a sorted order. Okay, let me let me do this on the whiteboard. 
I'm going to keep the projector because you know, this is how I'm going to copy it. So we have five, okay? So graphically, you can look at the five as a node, it's a root. This is left, this is right. The left of the node, or N1, the node is, has N2, and N2 has a value of three. That particular node has no left node, but it does have a right node of N4, which has a value of four, okay? The right node of five is N3. N3 itself has a value of 10. It has a left node that has a value of nine, and it has no right node. That is the tree that I'm constructing using um, the assembly code. And gosh darn it, I just you know, answered my own question of number three. Ah! <laughs> I'm going to draw some random stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, there we go. That should totally mislead you guys you know, to the wrong answer. OK. <laughs> Okay, but this is a traversal, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an in-order traversal, so that means five is not gonna, we're not gonna do anything about five because we first examine what is to its left. Something is to its left, okay? But we're not gonna do something about this one until we confirm that there's nothing here. Then we go back here and say, okay, we'll put five, put three into the array, and then we explore what is to the right-hand side. Ah, there's a four. We say that there's nothing to the left of four, nothing to do. Then we put four into the array. Then we check whether there's, there's something to its right, nothing there, back to here. But we already put four into the array. Back here, we already put three into the array. We go back here, we put five into the array. So at this point, we have three, four, and then five in the array. Then we go on to the right-hand side of five, and go like, is there, some, is there something there? Yep, there's a 10, but we don't do anything yet because 10 has a left-hand node. We go to nine, it has no left-hand node, we put nine into the array. Then we check whether it has a right-hand node. It doesn't have a right-hand node. We go back to this, but we already put nine into the array. There's nothing to do at this point. We go back to 10, then we put 10 into the array. Then we check whether there's anything to the right-hand side of 10. There's nothing to the right-hand side of 10. We go back to 10, but there's nothing to do because we already put 10 into the array. We, but we go back to 5. We got nothing to do because we put 5 into the array already. So the array that we know as sorted in main as a local variable should have the values 3, 4, 5, um, 9, and 0a. So all of these are bytes, OK? So these five bytes should be at the beginning of sorted if traverse is working correctly. Is that OK? So when I'm testing your code, I'm going to give it a different tree just so that people do not put those you know, five bytes directly into sorted and, so, and call it a day. It's like, I'm done. I'm just changing the first five bytes of those memory locations. I'm done. <laughs> People looking for shortcuts, right? <laughs> huh? I have nine twice. This is zero A, yeah. Bad penmanship. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you who have who have taken CISP 430, what do you think of this assignment? <laughs> It is it's actually easier than the swap subroutine. If you really think about it, this is actually easier than the swap subroutine. Huh? Yep. So it's 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 it it, beco it becomes a you you have to basically understand the concepts now. It it it's really is a concept issue. The code is not going to be long, I can almost tell you that. Um, the difficult part is, the difficult part is using, putting something into the array, but that becomes just a double dereference, which is, 
something that you that's that, that's not too bad. I mean, it's just one more dereference, right? So, so I don't think it. I, I think in terms of uh, lines of code, this is going to be about the same as swap and also Fibonacci. I don't think that this is any more than that. But it's it's the concept and also how you're going to debug it that is going to be the tricky part. That will be the tricky part. Yep. All right, I'm going to turn off the uh, recorder.